And what this does is it allows the Hellion to withstand a lot of this late game Zealot Archon uh, attacks that right now they have to kite like crazy to deal with. And maybe more importantly, it really allows them to be an end game fighter in those scenarios where there's just a lot of splash on the battlefield. If there's a lot of Colossus in play, if there's any number of siege tanks in play, you can bet that your Hellions aren't going to survive that first blast as they close to engage. So the Hellion right now is relegated absolutely to that sort of early to mid game raider and harasser. And only in very special players can get the ability to make this a really massable unit for end game battles. So I'm going to show you what this transformation looks like. I think our artist did a pretty good job on it. And now I'm going to show you a little video of these guys in action. Now this video was made just for clarity. This is not how it would look in a real sort of esports encounter, but you'll get the idea. Here you can see the Terran players trying to sort of get away. He's kiting not real well, but reasonably well against these zealots. He just can't stand up to this kind of firepower. So we go back up into the base. We're going to get some Hellions in play here. We're cheating a little bit with the choke, but you get the idea. And they'll deploy into their battle form. And now with all this overlapping splash and their additional toughness, these Hellions will be able to withstand this charge and really deal with this kind of zealot Archon threat. Hellions ordinarily be very unhappy with all the splash damage coming down on their heads from their own siege tanks, let alone from the Archons and the attacks of the zealots in front of them. But the Battle Hellion, being a lot tougher, can stand up to this kind of firepower and can remain a relevant unit in these kinds of late game battles. All right, I'll let David talk about the Warhound. So the Warhound is the new factory unit. Um, it's a me mechanical unit. Um, its main role is um, the anti-air mass mutilist role like the Thor used to have. And it's a medium cost, fairly uh, fast moving um, mechanical unit. So it's pretty much just a smaller, faster version of the Thor. So it won't suffer from the two uh, Thor problems that we mentioned before. But the main difference of the Warhound compared to the Thor is that it's got an anti-mechanical ground attack, which means if you're fighting against another Terran player who's using mostly factory-based units, uh, this is a very powerful unit to use against that. And also against Protoss, because most of the Protoss ground units are mechanical units, um, in a straight-up mass situation, I think the only non-mechanical unit Protoss has is the Zealot. So this really allows us to move the Thor up into a different role. And the role that we chose for the Thor was the limit one, uh, super high health, high uh, burst damage, really easy to use, attack move friendly unit. Um, so this really allows us to fulfill the fantasy of the Uber unit that uh, the mothership really couldn't fulfill back in Wings of Liberty. The mothership had a lot of problems. It was slow moving. Um, it was always the first target to kill because of the cloak ability um, and it had a uh, bunch of powerful spells, so if you didn't use those spells, uh, the mothership was not as powerful as it could be. So we're hoping that this new Thor uh, really caters to that group of players that really want that uber sort of unit. Um, yeah. And I'd just like to point out that this unit is definitely under construction, and in our internal playtests, this unit felt pretty strong, uh, especially against Terran and Protoss, um, and against Mutalisks as well, but we just uh, we just want to always look for more feedback on this guy, so if you get a chance to go out to the playtest stations and just check it out uh, and give us feedback, that would be greatly appreciated. So in this first video, you'll see the Hellions and Warhounds going up against the more traditional uh, Marine tank army. So the Marines and tanks are spread out pretty well, so the Hellions will go into the new battle mode, uh, to, which would allow them to withstand the siege tank fire a lot easier while the Warhounds are picking off the Siege Tanks using Focus Fire. They actually have 7 range, so they're pretty good at picking off Siege Tanks like this. So obviously, if all these Siege Tanks and Marines were packed up tightly into a choke point, there's no way this Hellion and Warhound army could push that line. But that's exactly what we wanted to go for. We wanted the more traditional Marine and Siege Tank army to be stronger at tighter chokes, um, with heavily defended chokes, whereas the Hellions and Warhounds have the more to fight against that in a different way. All right, the Shredder. So the Shredder is a new Terran radiation robot. This is kind of a weird unit for us. We're trying some new stuff we've never really tried in the game before with this guy. He's very, very cheap board control. The Terrans have some pretty decent board control um, with their siege tanks, but it's not very cheap. And if you leave a siege tank off by himself to try to control some part of the map, I'm guessing that's what's going to happen to him pretty quick. 
and we want something that is not added to the ball of death. This is a term our fans have coined for just a big blob of Marines, Marauders, Medevacs, really almost any group of units in the game. It's got a ton of stuff in it, and you sort of put it in one control group, and you attack, move with it, and you kind of hope. And it's very difficult. Yeah, I've, I've done that many times. So it's, it's very difficult to really know how to control that, and it's kind of a pain for the enemy to figure out how to counter it because he's looking at this big ball of stuff coming at him. So we don't want to add any more to that. And this guy is fundamentally not allowed to be added to the ball of death, and I'll show you why. So these guys can move out, and they can take a little bit of time to set up, and they can create a powerful radiation death field, which gives the Terrans some ferocious board control. That's, that's, that's too bad. Sorry, Nesty. All right. But he has a fundamental weakness. He can't keep his radiation field on near other units that aren't shredders. If other units move into the radius, they'll shut it off. So it doesn't hurt them. So in this case, these Marines stim and rush forward, you see the field just shut off. No shredder fire at all. Now, when the Marines get out of the radius, the shredder turns back on. Now, in this case, the shredders got lucky. In reality, this, most of the time, these shredders get wiped out in these types of scenarios. You need to keep this unit away from the rest of your army or it is absolutely useless. And so it's very important to manage this guy carefully. So we're hoping this is a way for the Terrans to get that kind of cheaper board control you would see in things like spider mines, but see it in a way that's kind of unique and really forces the Terrans to spread out their army and not clump up on top of these things. So this is where we're at today with the Terrans. We've got the new Battle Hellion, we've got the new Warhound, and we've got this crazy new unit called the Shredder. We're hoping this creates a lot more diversity in play between the Terrans and their opponents, and at the same time, gives the Terrans a few more strategic options, hopefully not giving the Terrans too many more options. I know a lot of players feel like they have too many already. But anything we can do to give them a little something without fundamentally destabilizing the game. So there's a common misconception out there um, that because this is a Zerg expansion, the name of the expansion is Heart of the Swarm, and we're all wearing Zerg uh, t-shirts, that Zerg will get the strongest units out of all three races. Um, but while this is not necessarily true, um, they do get some powerful options. So before we get into the actual units, let's talk about some of the weaknesses that they, that they have in Wings of Liberty. So Zerg suffers a little bit from siege challenges, especially in the early and mid-game stages. Uh, so if, um, it's very common for a Terran or a Protoss player to take his natural expansion and really defend that location very heavily. And the only response for the Zerg player is to go for an econ battle uh, by making another hatchery. So we were hoping that in Heart of the Swarm, if there was an, another option to this by having, if the Zerg were, players were able to invest heavily in, um, in an army instead of the expansion and just push that line, um, that might create more uh, potential for Zerg gameplay. Zerg units also suffer from some missed opportunities. Uh, the Overseer is a good example of this. You don't really see neither of the spells that the caster has being utilized too often. And this is sort of intentional because um, the Overseer costs zero supply, which means you can build as many as you want in any given game, which means if the abilities were kind of powerful, then the Zerg at the 200 pop case would be way too overpowered compared to the other races. Uh, the Corruptor, on the other hand, is really effective at what it's, do, uh, what it's supposed to counter. So for example, if you're fighting against a Protoss player, um, against Colossi, you build, say, like 10 or more Corruptors out, and you kill the two Colossus that he has. And the Protoss player, if he uh, decides not to build the Colossus anymore, there's really uh, nothing for the Corruptors to do until the very late game when you can morph into Broodlords. All right, so I'm going to talk a little about our new ability for the Ultralisk. The Ultralisk has a little bit of a size problem. He needs to go on a little bit of a diet. He's had this problem for many, many years, and it makes it very difficult for your Ultralisk to get into battle. He gets stuck on your own Zerg units. He gets stuck, of course, on enemy units, and you often lose these guys, or you certainly don't maximize their ability um, because they're so big. And the Ultra, of course, in Wings of Liberty has been a powerful end-of-game splash unit. We want to kind of buff this a little bit in Heart of the Swarm. Banelings are, of course, mighty enough, and you can use Fungal as well, but both these units have some pretty harsh counters. And we want to find a way, if you really just need to clean up a lot of Marines, you have a way to really do that with a lot of Siege Tanks already on the battlefield. So we're adding this Burrow Charge ability on the Ultralisk that allows him to bring the battle right to the heart of the enemy.
You're welcome, Nesty. So the Viper is the new spell, uh, full spellcaster unit. It's got three full spells, just like any other spellcaster in the game. So this means that the Overseer is cut, and the Viper will be taking a spot. The main role of the Viper is to break choke points. Uh, so in this screenshot here, you'll see Blinding Cloud being cast against a bunch of uh, ranged units. And what this ability does is it makes it so that every unit underneath the cloud uh, gets their attack range reduced to one. So other than that spell, uh, we also have other spells that, prob that will potentially create new strategies. Um, so in this screenshot, you're seeing Immortals get pulled into the Zerg army so that the Zerg army can easily focus fire and kill them before engaging the Protoss force. So in this video, you'll see a uh, blinding cloud in action, and the Marines aren't able to kill a single Baneling before they approach and kill everything. Of course, you can micro against this by uh, moving the Marines out of the cloud. So in this second video, um, you'll see the Colossi being pulled down the ramp so that the Zerglings can engage, and if the Colossus tries to run back up, you can pull him right back down and kill him. All right, I'm gonna talk about a new Zerg artillery unit called the Swarm Host. Now this guy is a great way to gain map control, and what he does is he burrows and he spits out for free a bunch of little timed life units called locusts, which swarm across the map. This is a very Zerg way to have an artillery unit. It's hopefully a very Zergy way to gain a bunch of additional sort of static map control. Obviously, Zerg have a decent amount of map control right now through sheer speed. They can use their Zerglings to threaten your base, makes you keep running back. They can use Mutalists to threaten your base, keeps you running back. We wanted something they could use to also just kind of fundamentally apply some pressure something that would really force the enemy to deal with the Zerg who had some kind of fundamental advantage. I'll show you how these guys work. Here's a bunch of these swarm hosts waddling into action here in front of this mighty looking Terran base. They'll just deploy into the ground, set their rally point, and a bunch of these locusts will start swarming into action. All these guys are free. And they're about, what, 90 hit points right now at this point? They do not a great amount of damage, but you can see that bunker has been ripped apart not only by the locusts, but also by the siege tank firing down on it. Give them a few seconds here, and hey, look what they're going to do. They're going to do it again, and again, and again, and again. It is the endless Zerg swarm knocking at your front door until you figure out a way to deal with it. In this case, these Terrans need to try to run forward and take them out. If there's a bunch of Zerglings behind those swarm hosts, that's probably not such a good idea. They may have to back up, and again, the Zerg have gained some board control, some advantage, and they've been allowed to siege that Terran base. It's not as immediately dangerous as a siege tank, because that bunker would be immediately vaporized if the siege tank had sold everything else. But it's the slow, methodical grind of the Zerg. So here's what we've got today for the Zerg. We've got the new Ultralisk, which allows them to burrow charge, take the battle right into the middle of the enemy. We've got the new Viper, which has a bunch of new ways to sort of mitigate damage against the swarm, as well as to steal enemy units and pull them right into your stack. And we have the Swarm Host, a new, brutal, methodical type of Zerg artillery that allows you to create for free the endless wave of the swarm sort of smashing against the enemy's line. So a lot of people might argue that the Protoss Ball of Death is a little too strong. Um, so Protoss doesn't really need new units in Heart of the Swarm. But even the mighty Protoss uh, suffers from some issues and we try to hope to solve these issues through new units. So the first problem that Protoss have in Wings of Liberty is they don't really have a solid, uh, constant raiding option throughout the whole game, especially in the early mid game. Um, so one thing about the raiding units that we wanted to avoid was pretty much every single raiding unit in Wings of Liberty focuses around how fast you kill workers, how effectively you kill workers. So for this new caster unit, we wanted to make sure that we don't really focus on killing units. At the same time, we wanted this caster to be um, viable throughout the course of the whole game and a very powerful option throughout the whole game as well. Protoss also suffers a little bit from the lack of AOE anti-air, especially in the late game. So I'm sure all those Protoss players out there have experienced fighting against Zerg, uh, who build, say, like 40 or 50 or even more Mutalisks in the late